The next major surface process is volcanism. Volcanism is the eruption of molten rock or magma onto the surface of a world. Notice that in the outer solar system, most moons have ice as the major surface rock, so the volcanoes there are ice volcanoes instead. Below we're seeing two pictures of Enceladus, a moon of Saturn, with active ice volcanoes. One of the images shows the eruption of water ice crystals out into the space surrounding Enceladus. Volcanism is powered by the internal heat in the world. The closer the interior is to being molten, the more volcanism there will be. The features that volcanism produces on the surface of a world depends mainly on the viscosity of the magma produced. By viscosity, we mean the magma's resistance to flow. So water is very low viscosity, while silly putty has a much higher viscosity. Let's look at the types of volcanic features produced by different... Low viscosity magma is the most fluid. Water volcanoes and very fluid rock magma fits this category. Low viscosity magma produces flat lava plains and rivers of lava. We see examples of this in places like the lunar maria, the dark, flat regions on the near side of the moon, and on much of the surface of Venus. Much of the Earth's ocean crust is also made from low viscosity magma, as well as some of the features on continents. For example, the Columbia River Plateau in eastern Washington state is built up from many layers of low viscosity lava. As the viscosity goes up, the magma can't flow as easily, so it starts to build up to form mountains. The characteristic mountain formed from intermediate viscosity magma is called a shield volcano. Shield volcanoes have very gentle slopes, but they can also get to tremendous heights. For example, Olympus on Mars is the largest volcano in the solar system, standing almost 30 kilometers high and covering an area comparable to a largest U.S. state. However, the slope is so gentle that if you were standing on it, you might not even realize you were on a mountain at all. Similarly, here on Earth, the large volcanoes in Hawaii, Mauna Kea and Mauna Loa, are shield volcanoes. These are the tallest mountains on Earth when measured from their base, which is far below sea level at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean. Finally, the most viscous magma tends to produce more steep-sided volcanoes, like the ones in the Cascades Range in the Pacific Northwest. The high viscosity of the magma makes it hard for gas to escape, so these volcanoes often erupt explosively the way Mount St. Helens did in 1980. In fact, many of the most destructive volcanoes on Earth have this sort of high viscosity magma. Geysers are also related to volcanic activity. A geyser forms when water or some other liquid seeps underground and is heated up enough to be then vaporized, the pressure forcing it back up above the surface. Different worlds form geysers from different materials. On the Earth, geysers are made of water, but on Mars, they form from frozen carbon dioxide. On Jupiter's moon Io, the geysers are made from sulfur dioxide, while on Neptune's moon Triton, they're made of liquid nitrogen. In the case of Mars and Triton, it's possible that the geysers are being powered by sunlight heating up ices, rather than the internal heat of the world. The next major geologic process is tectonics. Tectonics means shaping the surface of a world with stresses. In other words, pushing or pulling on the surface. When the surface is being pulled apart, we call this extensional tectonics. This typically produces cracks or valleys on a planet's surface. On the other hand, when the surface is being pushed together, we call that compressional tectonics. Compression usually leads to forming mountain ranges and ridges. Either way, the surface features produced by tectonics tend to be linear, straight, or gently curving lines on the large scale. Note that here on Earth, we have plate tectonics. This is a special case of tectonics that we don't see on other worlds. 
We'll look at plate tectonics in more detail later on. But in the meantime, don't assume that all tectonics are related to crustal plates. Like volcanism, tectonics is related to the internal heat of the planet. There are several ways that internal heat can cause stretching and squeezing of the surface. One example of this comes from changing crustal temperatures. As the rocks below the surface cool, they contract. This causes the surface to buckle, producing ridges and scarps like this one on Mercury. Another way that the internal heat can drive tectonics is through convection in the mantle. When the hot convective flow moves upward, it spreads apart, pulling the crust with it. Similarly, when the flow sinks down into the mantle, the crust compresses, building up mountain ranges. We'll look at this more when we discuss plate tectonics on Earth. Finally, a third way to generate tectonics is through tides. We know that the repeated flexing and squeezing associated with tides on a moon can generate heat. What we find is that these same stresses can cause repeated parallel ridges and valleys and make a pattern we see on several outer solar system moons, such as Jupiter's Europa here. We've just seen that tectonics can be caused by convection. Given that, does this statement make sense? If a planet were sufficiently close to its sun, solar heating of the planet's surface could cause convection and tectonic motion in the planet's mantle. Explain why this is or is not a reasonable statement. The final surface process is erosion. Erosion is the wearing away of a surface due to wind, water or other liquids, or ices. In general, erosion tends to flatten a surface. It wears material away from high points and fills in the low spots. Erosion creates a wide range of different surface features, including river and glacial valleys, wind and wave-cut rock structures, sand dunes, floodplains, and deltas, to name just a few. The catalog of possible features is much too long to go through in this course. However, we can look for the three main components to an eroding system. There's the eroding material, such as flowing water or wind. There's the eroded surface. This is the surface that's been cut away by erosion, such as a river valley or a glacier-cut mountainside. Finally, there's the sediment, the debris that's been eroded away. This radar image shows an eroding system on the Earth with all of its components. The mountains in the top of the picture are heavily eroded. You can see where they've been cut by river channels on all of their surfaces. In a few places, you can even see the water in some of the river beds and lakes on the lower half of the image. They show up as dark areas because they tend to reflect away the radar signals used to create the image. Finally, there's the sediment. Almost all of the lower half of the image is a fairly level flood plain. Large flat areas like this are often signs that erosion has occurred, though they can sometimes be confused with flat lava plains. So have you figured out where this eroding system is? In fact, it's the San Gabriel Mountains and the valleys below them. Yes, we really are living on a floodplain. Erosion is the rarest of the four major surface processes. It requires the presence of moving air, liquid, or ice across the surface. This requires an atmosphere and enough differences in temperature around the surface to make these move. For example, Venus has a substantial atmosphere, but the temperature is the same everywhere, so there's very little wind on its surface. In fact, there are only three worlds in which we've seen a lot of erosion. We already mentioned Earth, the world with the most erosion, and the most diverse types of erosion in the solar system. The other two are Mars and Saturn's moon Titan. Mars has a long history of wind erosion and shows signs that in the past it had substantial water erosion as well. Titan is the only moon with a substantial atmosphere. It has lakes and rivers of liquid ethane, as well as wind-blown dunes 
made of grains of hydrocarbon ice. Now that we've gone through the major surface processes, see if you can put together the key features of each of them in this table. Let's summarize the key ideas behind surface processes. There are four main surface processes. Impact cratering, volcanism, tectonics, and erosion. We can use the number of impact craters on a surface as a guide to how active the surface is. If there are many craters, then the surface is old and there is very little geologic activity. If there are a few craters, then the surface is young and there's a lot more activity. We can extend this idea to piece together the history of a world from the superposition of features on its surface. Internal heating plays a key role in driving tectonics and volcanism and it's indirectly important for erosion as well. We already know that larger worlds are more likely to be warmer inside than smaller ones, so we can say that larger worlds are more likely to be geologically active than smaller worlds. So Earth and Venus are more geologically active than Mars, which in turn is more geologically active than Mercury or the Earth's moon. However, Remember that ice melts more easily than rock, so an icy world can be active at a much smaller size than a rocky one. This is one of the reasons many icy outer solar system moons are geologically active, despite being smaller than Mercury. Lastly, remember that all of this applies to worlds that have a solid surface. We don't really talk about the geologic activity of a Jovian planet because there's no solid surface on which to have that activity. We just saw that the mass of a planet determines how much interior heat it has and the composition determines how much of that heat is needed to make a planet active. There are a couple of other important factors that can play a role in surface processes as well. The distance from the star is one of the key things determining how hot the surface of a planet can be. We'll talk about this more when we get to the atmospheres, but remember that while the interior of a planet can be heated by processes like radioactive decay and contraction heating, the surface depends mainly on sunlight. So being close to the sun will make the surface of a planet hotter. This doesn't do much for volcanism or tectonics, but it does determine what sort of erosion is possible on the surface. Depending on the surface temperature, you might see erosion by moving ice, water, or air. The other factor to consider here is the spin of the planet. As we'll talk about in the atmospheres chapter, fast spin can drive strong winds and even storms, so it can play a role in erosion. See if you can apply what we've just learned about surface processes. Here's a world with a mass of 0.05 Earth masses and a distance of 1 AU from its star. What surface processes should be most important here? Make sure you explain why. We've included data for the planets in our solar system so that you've got something to compare it to. Here's a table we've seen before. This time, we'd like you to try filling in the surface processes column. You'll probably have to look up the specifics for some of these worlds in your textbook, though for a few of them, you can also look ahead at the next few lectures, where we cover the surface processes on a couple of these worlds. Now have a look at your mystery solar system. If you're working with a group, you should compare your worlds with the rest of your group. Decide who has the most geologically active world, and how you can tell. You'll need to look at factors like size and rotation here, and remember that Jovians don't have solid surfaces, so they won't count. Also decide which planet would have the most impact craters, and how you can tell. Remember to say which solar systems you're looking at.